All right, so for folks that are staying tuned with us, we are bringing you a segment here in terms of answering any of your questions. If you've got any burning questions, how do you cope with redundancies? How you might want to develop your career in a different arena? Well, we bring you Alok Gupta and Vinny Tam, both Tam, career, coaches, career coaches, to take you through your questions, questions to help you progress, help you progress your, career. your career. Over to, over you, to you, Alok. Over to you, Vinny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shalina. Thank you. So welcome, everybody, and thanks for staying for this Q and A session. Um, as the person who have yeah, been through multiple career changes and also very passionate about coaching, thank you, Alok. It's very nice of you. Yeah, so I'm very pleased to be here today to be sitting down with Alok to discuss with him what are some strategies or what are some insights for us to navigate through 2021 under this pandemic. Um, Alok is a very renowned executive coach who has set in past um, 75, 78 years have been doing executive coaching, and he has an extensive corporate experience in sales and also HR. So we're, I'm really thrilled to have, them with, have him with us today. Um, and also, I'm sure you have a lot of burning questions for Alok. And if you do have some question around um, career or career management, um, say job searching, also switching careers, etc. Feel free to leave your questions in the chat box. And also, if you want to ask Alok questions directly through the audio or video, um, do private message us and we'll answer you shortly. And we'll open up the floor in, in a moment. So, um, Alok, since you're here, although I know everybody has a lot of questions for you, um, I'll be interested to know, because um, I think it, well, it would actually be quite beneficial for our audience to understand what a career coaching is. So in your opinion, or in your definition, what coaching actually is, or more specifically, career coaching? Yeah. No, thank you very much. And that was a great introduction, Shalina. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vinny, for doing this. Uh, I mean, say right, right on to your question, uh, what is career coaching? Uh, let me give you two definitions. What is the traditional definition and then what should be the futuristic definition because it's evolved. So what is a traditional definition? Normally, when people think about career coaches, they think about what? CV, interview, uh, you know, job searching. This is what the traditional definition is. And I'm not saying it's gone. Very important. And for these kind of coaches, you need somebody who has a recruiting background, who can maybe help you with writing a better CV, who can help you with interviews, who can help you with job searches. Now, this is a different segment of career coaches. And absolutely, you know, when you think about career, that is the first thing which comes in mind because that's how it started. So that's one segment. Now, how is career coaching evolved? Now, career coaching is about the whole career, isn't it? It is about passion. It's about boss management, or can I say politics management, right? There's so many things. So broadly, there is one type of coaches which helps you getting a job, right? And there's another set of coaches which helps you retaining a job. Mm -hmm. Now, retention is about so many things. So essentially, the way I operate, yes, I can help you get a job, but I am the guy who actually helps you grow in your career. Now, for me, there's one word which associates career coaching and brings to life is growth. Now, growth be from internal promotions, growth be through external job hunters, growth could be just developing your skill set. Because if you don't develop your skill set, how do you reinvent? So a lot of clients come to me for reinvention, and that's the word you see all across the conference today, because some people are stuck in the wrong job and they may want to go to a next job. So in short, uh, Vinny, uh, career coaches for me is about growth, but then growth can define into multiple aspects. That's Yes, I really like that definition because when I talk to a lot of people about career coaching, they usually think about what you said, CV or mock interviews, which are actually more consultative 
and rather than the um, more questions type of coaching. So pretty much of today's theme is around um, COVID uncertainty food care world. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, what are the future careers that you think will emerge in the next couple yes. of years? Yes. As as you know, a lot of people are experiencing layoffs, and they really, really want to switch to another career. So, what would you, what would, what would be your view on views on this? So, I was distracted for a minute. Uh, can you repeat that question for me? So, you're talking sure. about layoffs, right? So, was the question on layoff? Um, so, so a lot of people are being laid off, and they have to consider other careers. So, um, in the next couple of years, what do you see are the more like emerging? types of mm. career. Yeah. And I get I, I guess that's a very relevant question. And and you know, people always ask this question to me that uh which is a great industry? They ask me, which is a great job? Oh, can I do Python? That's making a lot of money. Should I be a banker? That is a very rich profession. My question to them is that my friend, I want to be the president of the United States of America because it's a great job. Somebody made a lot of money doing it. Can I be one? The answer is no. The point is not which job, which industry is good or bad, because I think we did spend a lot of time today uh, fleshing out industry which are good or bad. The answer now from a career coaching perspective is what is good or bad for you? Now, I may love Python data science because it is going to give me a huge salary, but maybe I'm bad at memory. Maybe I'm bad at analytics. So that is not a job for me. Mm -hmm. So the question we should ask is not which industry is good, but which industry is good for me. So the people who are getting laid off, the number one thing they should do is to do a self-analysis they need to kind of do a self check to what are my strengths, what are my passions, and then create an action plan to identify those industries which match with that. So it's like a matchmaking. Think about a job as marrying a wife or a husband. Now, what happens if you get a toxic wife or a toxic husband? Life becomes miserable, right? Same thing in a job. You're spending eight, 10 hours with that spouse, which is called a job. If you get a miserable job, life is going to be miserable. So the short answer, Vinny, is that we need to first identify our strengths, our passion, our interests. Then we need to match those industries mm. which bring them to life, whichever those industries are. Does that help? Um, of course, I think that's a very great insight. And writing on that, I would actually love to know, because when people talk about... Um, finding a career that I love, it seems to be very idealistic to a lot of them. And they, they still have this mindset of, okay, let me, because I am in trouble, I want to look at the jobs, the vacancies that are already, already available mm -hmm. in the market. Yeah. So, so what are your insights or experience um, for, for them to be able to really have the courage to explore or even create the kind of role career that they yeah. want to have? No, no, absolutely. And that's a very relevant question. And let me step a little bit back because you are something really uh, relevant over here that uh, what if you lost the job? What if you have, you have no money to talk about, uh, to pay for your mortgage? Mm -hmm. Is that a time you should look at your passion? Maybe not. And I'm going to relate uh, or use an analogy for passion meditation. And the great Buddha said, you cannot meditate on an empty stomach, right? So if you don't have food on the table, my friends, if you don't have money to feed your family, forget passion, you know? And this is maybe the first guy in today's whole day of speakers telling you, forget passion if you don't have money to feed your children or your family, right? So what I'm going to give you is the five S. And I'm sure all of you would have read it at some point, but I'm sure uh, also that very few of you implement these five S's. And if you're not, this is time to refresh your memory and check if you're implementing it in your life. What are the five S's? <clears throat> the first S is survival, right? So you need to kind of really think about survival. Any job will do. <laughs> if you have no money to kind of survive, to pay the bill, you know, get the food, 
any job will do. Even I don't mind sweeping the floor if I need to survive, right? That's number one. Once you kind of are surviving, you think about the second S, which is security, right? You need a, a security over your head. You need a home. You need something which can make you secure, a bank account, right? Things like that. Once you get that, you go to the third S. Now you need a girlfriend, a boyfriend, right? You need a community. You need friends. You can spend time and go to the bar, right? Or obviously in COVID, there are less bars now, but maybe have a drinks with two people. So that's the third S. And then you have the fourth S, which is self-esteem. Now that I have money for the first three, and this is like a ladder, then you think about, you know, buying that car, buying that Rolexes, because it's a luxury. And finally, you have self-esteem. Sorry, self-actualization. What is self-actualization? There are two means for self-actualization. One is deep. Nirvana, enlightenment, let's not go there. <laughs> There's a second one, which is more practical. What is that? That is about passion. That is about purpose. That's about meaning. Very realistic. Because at some point, money is going to start looking redundant. And if you don't make it look redundant, you're going to get stuck for your whole life on stage four and three and feel miserable. Why is that? Because how many cars are you going to buy, my friend? How many girls, you're going to date my friend, <laughs> you know, it's not going to give you that gratification, that satisfaction need, which is stage number five, which is self-actualization. So that is where your passion lies. And to summarize many, that great question uh, you asked that if you are redundant and laid off, you should check what stage of that life you are. And if you are the survival stage, forget passion for now, then think about which stages you are. And if you're on self-esteem, clearly you need to grow to self-actualization or passion. Mm. I think that's very practical. You, you first have to think about survival, of course. And that reminds me of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. It is, too. It is yeah. Maslow hierarchy. So absolutely. So yeah, that's a label you can use. But, but, but the important thing is that how do you define it using life? That is what is going to yes. do the magic. It is absolutely. And the credit goes to Mr. Maslow for discovering that. <laughs> Well, and, and I really like how you use metaphors and how, how you use your analogy to put things into context, because we, we, I think in this world, we're all, we're all about learning new stuff. And then it's, it's sometimes it's to, in order to make stuff work, make our knowledge work, we really have to apply to what's practical for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have been talking about um, redundancy and also um, layoff. Let me just go yeah. on one more question and then we'll go through the, um, sure. the questions from the audience. So for those who are still at their job, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are worrying about their job security. So in that sense, in survival kind of mode, what would be your insights for them? Yeah, <laughs> all right. So uh, people who are kind of trying to retain a job, you yes. mean, right? So uh, clearly it's a tough time and you don't want to be the name in the list. Uh, well, I was different. I wanted to be the name in the list so that I can maybe jump and do something else and travel the world for a for some time, uh, maybe not now, but maybe after a few years, <laughs> travel the world. Uh, travel has become such a problematic thought. Uh, we want to travel, but we can't. Uh, anyway, coming back to the question of, of uh, what should you do to retain your job? So clearly, uh, I would leave you with one word, value. You need to see how you can be valuable to the organization. And I'm appalled by the number of people which take their job for granted, right? And I have people coming to me for coaching. Alok, I'm like sick of my boss, you know? And yesterday, uh, you know, Shalina was telling me a story of one gentleman uh, who kind of hates his boss. And he's not grateful that in this COVID-19 world, he has a job, right? Because I, I do have another case study of a person who came to me and I told her not to quit because, uh, you know, you, you need to first get an opportunity before you quit, because if you quit and what if you don't get the job? And clearly this person did not listen. Uh, she quit and now uh, it's been a few months and her overconfidence has obviously become confidence. I hope it doesn't become underconfidence, but she doesn't have a job. So the point is that retention of what you have is very important and specifically you need to make it valuable. Now, how do you become valuable? Now that's a million strategies over there, but what I'm gonna share is only two. 
Number one, you have to make sure that you do what you're supposed to do really, really well. So whatever job description, whatever role description is that, make sure you do it. And I know so many people who don't do even that. You know, they try to get out of office on time. They don't try to uh, do stuff which is beyond their job. Uh, they have to do that. Number two, visibility. You need to make sure that you're visible to the employees, you're visible to the other people so that people can actually see that the work you're doing is great. And that is about walking the extra mile. So these are two strategies I want to share. Number one, do what you're supposed to do really well. And second mm -hmm. is become visible across the organization. That should help you with the retention. Value and visibility. Um, so Shalina, we have some questions from the floor. Well, we have one in particular that's come up and it was a good segue um, into upskilling yourself. Um, so here's a question from Neeraj Majan. He asks, given the rapid change industries that are undergoing, how do I recognize upcoming trends and skills in order to be able to, up, to keep myself relevant? Yeah. yeah, and that's, that's great, a great, great, great point, point, you know, and, and a lot of people, people kind of uh, talk about what courses I do, what skills I do. Uh, to me, it's like asking which gym should I go to? <laughs> you know, which exercise should I do? Well, anything will do, start it first. You know, I always give this amazing quotation and, and Neeraj, uh, thanks for that question. And this is something everyone should make a note that success is not an outcome of hard work. Listen carefully, I speak controversial phrases. Success is not an outcome of hard work, it's an outcome of consistent work. Going to the gym once in a month is not going to help you. Going there every day is going to help you. So when it comes to skill, yes, you need to identify what skills you need to develop. And then are you consistent, consistently investing that one hour every day to develop those? Because you're not going to magically do a certification from Coursera and suddenly become an agile expert doesn't work like that you know in fact certifications become irrelevant the moment you're in front of an expert because he gonna feel you he's gonna check you out and in a minute he can tell you whether you know your stuff or not so whether it comes to skill development broadly all skills can be put into two segments uh, soft skills and hard skills you know we like to in LSF call it business intelligence and technical skills now whatever this aspect is most people are kind of not balanced. Some people are very good with soft skills. Some people are very good with technical skills. You need to find a holistic way to balance those two things. So Neeraj, I hope that answers your question and technical and hard skills is what you need to develop. So that was, that was a response, Shalina, uh, for the question uh, from Neeraj. Talking about um, what you said just now and also the visibility internally, um, what you mentioned in the previous question, um, I'm actually wondering because over the past few years, you have been quite active on social media, building your own uh, personal branding. So for, for someone who are currently a corporate employee, um, maybe he or she is a little bit of an introvert um, and is shy about um, creating more visibility within the company. What would be something that would be useful for him or her to do? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, say, how do you get more visible? And I, I do remember another person uh, asked me a similar question. I guess uh, this is a shout out to you, Shaliman, uh, who also you know, quit her very comfy job to become a coach. And I guess uh, you know, a lot of people in the room and outside the room are trying to become a coach. The important thing is that you need to be careful. <laughs> Why you need to be careful? Because it goes to your previous question, Vinny. Uh, you want to retain your job first. And you don't want to create a situation where you kind of uh, you know, try to create a personal branding and your company takes offense. And I did that as well. So when I was in HBC, I did have the same challenge. And being a bank, uh, it's quite challenging to kind of uh, do stuff when you have compliance and restrictions. Yes. So what I did was I raised my brand by doing a lot of charity work, a lot of community work, a lot of not-for-profit uh, trainings. And this is a lot of companies, uh, HSBC being a huge CSR uh, fund contributor is associated to a lot of companies. So I found ample opportunities inside the bank and also associations with the bank, which raised my visibility because 
I was being politically correct because I was doing all the work which they would have no objection to, but I was doing the craft or building the skill set which I wanted to build. So it doesn't matter who the consumer was. I was doing a lot of work externally and that raised my visibility through the video, through the media and all those things. And that is something which all of you can do. You need to find ways to kind of raise your visibility in the market, but also you need to find a right balance. I know people who kind of dump LinkedIn every day and to an extent when then people start muting them, you don't want that. And at the same time, you don't want to be somebody who's kind of not writing at all. Now, that is also a problem. So you need to find that right balance that how much visibility you want in social media, how much time you want to kind of invest in conferences, how much time you want to be meeting people. So there's no right or wrong over here. I would say it's a daily tweaking because even think about search engine optimization. Every day, Google changes the algorithm. So there's yeah. no hack over here. You need to learn daily and find a way to build your visibility. But there's nothing more powerful than neither just question where he was asking about how do you build a skill? So you need to be rock solid in terms of build your, building your skill because when you do get that opportunity, people can actually stand up and listen. Okay, let's open up the floor for some questions from the audience. Nivraz, do you have a question? A question. So thanks so much for the opportunity, Alok. I think it was a great session. We learned so much. Uh, so just to give a background, so I'm sorry. So my name is Nifraz. Nifraz, I work uh, for a, for a nonprofit at the moment. Overlooking communications and public relations. Uh, so just to give some context, so I've been working in the financial industry for almost 15 years. I've been working, I mean, for the same uh, sort of uh, organization for 15 years. I've worked in different uh, uh, locations, different countries. I've moved uh, uh, roles. Uh, however, due to the restructuring, uh, so, so last year I lost my job. And then because I was so comfortable within the, the, you know, the bank, uh, and then it took me a while to sort of you know, reinvent myself as to what I want to do next. Uh, so at the moment, I'm working for a, for a nonprofit in Hong Kong, but it took me a while uh, to figure that out. Uh, so my question to the panel is, um, what are the things that you, know, you should be doing if you are still employed in an organization, but still nervous about losing your job? I mean, in other words, uh, how can you find a backup in case of a redundancy? No, maybe I'm going to check with Vinny. What do you think? Uh, how do you get a backup if you are worried you're going to get on the list? <laughs> <laughs> I think if if I were this person, I would, if I were Nifras, I would probably look at what my hobbies are. And is there anything that I can develop um, just to do some side hustle mm. with that and start with that and gain, gain some confidence and you know you have a backup plan? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely love that because um, uh, I would say side hustle could be many things. It could be kind of uh, becoming a blogger, uh, becoming a writer, doing some videos or, you know, doing work for charity. And I, I feel that the work for charity is something which is the easiest thing to do because charity actually allows you to not only do great work, but at the same time, you can choose charity which aligns with your future orientation. So, for example, uh, you know, we all have limited time. So there were a lot of opportunities for me to go to old age homes. And I'm not saying there's anything good or bad about it. I'm just saying I did not do that because... I just had limited time. Instead, I told the, 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 myself that I'm going to only do stuff which is going to be around teaching, training, coaching. So that is the, how I use my time. So not only that elevated my brand, but it sent out feelers that this guy is really good in what he does. And therefore, I start getting opportunities over there. So what I would say is that uh, apart from that, which is visibility, the second thing you should do is to kind of start sending feelers out discreetly. You don't want to let your employer know, so ban them from viewing your profile and you can do that on LinkedIn. Uh, don't let your current employer check your profile, but try to get uh, other people to see your profile, like especially recruiters, start meeting them, connecting, networking with them. And that's the second thing you want to do. And the third most important, and this may sound biased, but you need to get a coach. 
because a coach will help you give me a career strategy so that you can really make a plan which is more strategic and i'm not saying which coach <laughs> the problem with finding coach is people try to find a coach with their head don't find with your heart where there's a connection of both ability and there's a heart connection so with these three strategies which is number 1 visibility number 2 you know networking and number 3 is finding a coach it should help you prepare for your next uh, backup in your language nephras but that was a great question thanks so much alok Thank you so much, and I think we have a couple more. So, who would like to come off mute? Let's go to Shalini. Yes, hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Shalini here. Yeah. Hi, Alok. Hi, Winnie. Uh, thanks a lot for the session today. I really enjoy it, and I get a lot of uh, takeaways from your sharing, and also from the guest speakers. And um, let me share a bit about. I have a brief introduction about myself before I recently worked in Extra Spicy for about five years. and i left this company to pursue my own passion in life and also in work so um so i'm currently um an entrepreneur and be my own boss so um currently i'm a coach that i will focus on two main areas the first area is uh focal coaching uh, which means i will uh, coach my clients to sing and also um to speak maybe in terms of public speaking as well The second part of the coaching that I focus on will be as a mindfulness coach that I will uh, coach my clients to understand more about the emotions and life. So um, my question will be: um, apart from uh, apart from having individual clients, if a coach would like to expand and collaborate or help more, I mean, I mean, collaborate uh, with the company clients, uh, what would be your advice to the coach? Um, in terms of maybe uh, the skill set and also in terms of maybe networking um, or any other areas that uh, we need to be you know, we need to pay attention to thank you yeah really um as a coach myself i think actually taking your advice for a previous <laughs> question what with nonprofits ngos and there they they have a lot of um opportunities there for you to uh, to first develop your um your reputation in the market and then you can get some testimonials for you to approach corporate clients and to also leverage uh, whatever network that you have go on linkedin approach people who you don't know or already know and um also 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 profile yourself do some social media um do some podcasts collaborate with other coaches i think that also works as well yeah what about you no absolutely and i'm i'm, I'm going to give a, you know i'm i'm a little bit of those uh, you know controversial person because knowledge i speak sticks and here's a controversial um uh, statement which shalimani you may never forget that coaching can never be sold right i see mm. that And the question to you is that how many doctors have you visited in your life after looking at an advertisement? Mm, not really. <laughs> all right. So essentially, yeah. it's all about referral. So essentially, therefore, you know, I I really find it amusing when coaches advertise, uh, you know, uh, that I'm a coach. I charge so much. Doesn't work. Yes, what you can do, you can do educational marketing. You can write a blog. You can write a thought leader. component that can be do so that is very subtle but that's that's where you're giving value to the people rather than putting out this i'm a coach and this is my service it doesn't work so don't try ever selling coaching spread the word and in my early years and this was about 8 10 years back when i was coaching i must have done thousands of hours of free coaching where people got to taste my power my craft and once they taste your ability and your craft they see value they will recommend you they will refer you and then you can charge does that make sense definitely yes it aligns with what i right. think as a well. yeah. totally and i really again another thing i find amusing that i'm a coach and i'm not going to charge anything less than $20,000 per session i'm like okay you can do that $20,000 session once in a year and sit at home the rest of the year well don't do that right find your market value and i can't tell you what is the right price for you i know coaches who work in 500 dollars and i know coaches who work in 500000 dollars so the point is that there's no right or wrong fee it is the value which the person perceive you should charge 
right? So I'm not going to give my my fee away on the airtime, but Shatiman, you know how much I charge. Vinny, you know how much I charge. Now, it did not come just easy. It took me about 10 years to charge that amount. And maybe it's going to take you a little bit more time to charge that amount. Uh, coaching is a big business, but it should be based on the work you do and not the, not the price you think you should get. Uh, so yeah. that one was for you, Shalima. Really, so congratulations so you. on taking on this journey. <laughs> we have one more person, is that right? Does Kenny, Kenny, Kenny. Join us? Um, Kenny, do you have a question for us? And first, thanks for having me here. Um, so just a little bit about my background. Uh, I quit my job early this year, and I'm trying to switch to a new career in energy sector, especially renewable energy. Um, so for the past four to five years, I've been working with my boss to set up a new company. So it was a like semi-entrepreneurial experience since I was involved in many decision-making process. Um, and now I'm assessing my own skill sets and trying to see if there are any transferable skills that I can apply to my next journey. So my questions would be like, for example, in finance, I have completed CFA exams and I've learned some uh, financial modeling skills from online courses like Copper Finance Institute and also also joined a e-learning course from Frankfurt School in Germany. So um, so I would like to know um, with knowledge and skills in financial modeling, but not the working experience, not the real time work experience. So how can I demonstrate these skills to my potential employees? Um, I think this is this is quite a tough one because it requires some knowledge about the industry and if you don't have that experience it's certainly more difficult for you to prove that um, I, I think it would be a good way for you if you um, network with um, people in that industry start generating or initiating conversations um, or maybe find find ways to do some pro bono projects for them maybe that could be a way so um, find more opportunity to try to get those hands-on experience and speak with people. Yeah, no, thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's, that's absolutely valid. Uh, and thank you for that question, uh, Kenny. Uh, that's a great question. And also there's no right answer to that question. Mm. But I think I'm going to leave you with a framework which maybe you will find uh, useful because you used a very powerful word over there. You used the word fungible. You will use the word, I think, transferable. Was it transferable? Yes, transferable. transferable right? So the, the word today, one of the speakers used was fungible, which means the same thing. So essentially, how can you really put your skills into this transferable bucket? And clearly, there are three of those buckets, because since you uh, use the word entrepreneur, so I would say there's another set of uh, skills which normally employees uh, don't need, but entrepreneurs do. And this is how I kind of put them into three buckets. Number one is the bucket of technical skills. If you are lower down in the bottom of management, then clearly this is what you need most of. It's like a pyramid uh, of sorts. And as you grow up in the ladder, what you need is what we call soft skills. They're the second set of skills you need. But if you're an entrepreneur, you need a third set of skills. And that's why I call it a triangle, which is what I call business skills. That's like you know taxation, negotiation, shareholding, fundraising. If you're an employee, you don't need to worry about this set of business skills. Uh, soft skills and hard skills or technical skills are enough. So if you try to kind of really develop yourself on these three skills, then clearly people will know. So everything Vinny said, whether it's networking, whether it's writing a blog, whether it's meeting people, they will be able to analyze that you have those skills in you. Uh, it's like something, I, I, as a child, I heard the story of my das, you know, the, the person who used to touch a person and the person who touched the gold. And that is what a developed skill set looks like. When you come into contact with someone, they can feel you. You don't really need to claim that you're a great communicator. They can see that. And therefore, always remember that, Kenny, if you try to claim somebody or not, people can see it through. And I'm going to leave you with this quote from Shakespeare, 
we should wrap everything I'm saying, everything saying together. What you are, what you are, shout so loudly in my ears, I cannot hear what you say. So essentially, words are meaningless because people can actually see through who you really are. And if you're that skillful person, I want to hire you, Kenny. Is that helpful? That also resonates with some of my thoughts. As I'm also trying to uh, write a blog uh, with some of my researches about the industry and some of my analysis and et cetera, et cetera. So I guess what you suggest seems to resonate with that. Super. Thank you very much. And, and I'm happy to touch base if you have further questions. Uh, was there one more person online? Was Yatin there? Uh, first off, uh, thank you so much, um, Alok, LSF, Global Team, just for giving me this opportunity and for the wonderful conference. Great insights, great learnings. Um, so a bit about myself. So I'm Yatin. So I basically graduated from HKUSD uh, this year. Um, and um, I'm really excited to be a part, you know, of giving me this opportunity just to ask this question to you. So it's typically from a perspective of the fresh graduates, you know, in the industry that we're looking at. Currently, what would be a key advice? And it's a very open-ended question. Um, in general, what would be a key advice to let's say, uh, you know, fresh graduates in these times who are currently sort of, you know, worried about the uncertainty in the job market or who just want to follow their passions, but they're in roles that they don't think are, you know, they don't see themselves in the long term on those roles. And it, it's coming from a perspective from, you know, a very special job market across the whole spectrum of people who are not employed and people who are currently employed in the market as well. So what would be your just general advice to these people, uh, you know, to, to graduates in general? Uh, um, one thing that I hear from Yetin is actually there's a lot of fears and assumption and limiting beliefs. I think rather than giving very actual advice, I think it would be it, it actually would be better for, for um, people, fresh graduates, to first reflect on themselves, what they really like, and uh, what they need for survival mode, as Alok mentioned earlier in the Q&A session, um, what they really need and what they want, and then see if there is anything in between that can collaborate, that can, they can do from there. Um, don't make too many assumptions before even getting your first job, and make an, as many job applications as as, uh, as you can that that would be my sharing no absolutely so uh, you know and, and yet and i'm sure you heard the five s's i shared uh, you know first uh, survival then it was security social self-esteem and self-actualization which is where passion lies the part is that you don't meditate on an empty stomach if you don't have a job you don't worry about your passion uh, so there are two pieces i want to share with you piece number one is what many said and here's a reinforcement beggars can't be choosers right so if you have zero jobs you don't think about passion first get a damn job and then make a choice so uh, mm -hmm. i have a nephew who kind of uh, had the same philosophy that i'm gonna do this 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 but you know he couldn't get those jobs so i'm like what do you have so he said i hate coding but i have got a coding job from accenture and i'm like you gotta be kidding me you got a job from accenture and you hate kidding and you're just out of uh, engineering school and he said what do i do i said tell me what are the options you have he said i got one more option from cognizant technologies I'm like what is that it's like that's a management training job but the salary is like four times less and it, it looks weird you know I, i'm not interested in that i'm like okay then what third choice is is nothing so i'm like what should you do accenture i'm like yeah jump for it and yes i'm not saying if you get something better don't switch switch but give that a fair chance. Don't be the fox who said the grapes are sour even before kind of tasting them. So that's my first piece of advice. Get mm -hmm. something and then evaluate your option after you've got those two, three job offers. The second piece of advice very quickly is about any job it takes at least two years to master. And the first year is all about learning and contributing and surviving. The second year is when you contribute and you can strategize for your next switch. Now, I'm not prescribing that you should stay for a job for at least two years, but I'm saying you decide when you have mastery, when the job has become second nature for you. Yes, there can be an exception where you totally hate and you fell into a wrong job, but if not, give it a fair chance. Try to stay in the job for at least one to two years and then make your switch. And then only you'll know that you truly love or hate the job because 
initially every job looks bad, eventually it grows on you. So give a you decide years, one, two months, whatever time you feel that you have given it a fair chance and you have mastery, then think about switching. Yatin, is that useful? Makes sense. Um, yeah, I think it answers, I think what a lot of my peers as well, a lot of people, you know, my age are going through as well. So thank you so much again um, for, for everything uh, today. And yeah, thank you. Um, since we're coming to an end, what would be one piece of important advice that you would like to offer to our um, our audience before we end the session? Sure. And, and maybe if I may just give two advices. Of course, sure. <laughs> uh, Lovely. One is for the people who are kind of trying to retain the job, right? And one is for the people who are trying to get the job, right? So let's talk about people who are trying to retain the job. So guys, uh, number one, gratitude. You got to be really grateful that you have a job because, you know, there are, there are a million people who don't. And clearly I'm not under uh, put, putting this number as a smaller number because clearly a lot of people don't have a job. You need to be really grateful that a lot of people uh, have, have a, don't have a job and you are one of those who have a job. So you need to make it valuable for the employer who is employed. You do your best because even if you get another job, his recommendation will have power. And if you go to another employee and you mess up your recommendation, when that person gets a reference check, you're going to have a problem with that. So that is number one. Number two, for the people who are trying to get a job or trying to reinvent themselves, think about the strengths you have. Think about the interest and passion you have and then work on the part you have to build. So it has to be a strategy which is internal more than external first identify what is internal and then match it with the external thing with these uh, with that carefully thought over strategy and action plan you can you can really find your calling or find the job you're truly passionate about so that's my two pieces of advice for people who are trying to keep the job and trying to get a job Mm. To summarize, I think it's all about doing the hard work and also doing a lot of reflection. Thank you so much, Allah, for the great and insightful advice and sharing for today. And even as a career coach myself, I feel I've, I've, really, I've learned a lot from what you've shared also. So I, I think that makes a very great ending for our event today. Thank you so much. And I wish you all a flourishing, fruitful career journey in 2021.